Welcome, everybody. I just want to mention if you're um, two upcoming screenings of Crystal City, uh, if you had to be in Sydney, Australia, uh, for the Mardi Gras Film Festival, it's there on the February 20th, and it's going to be in San Francisco on March 9th. Then uh, there's others to come. So welcome, everybody. As Scott mentioned, this is the addiction Q&A. Uh, I do start with a little bit of a topic, and then we kind of go wherever people would like to go and whatever people would like to talk about. Um, I want to start tonight. I, I'm doing another webinar uh, every week on a site called In the Rooms, and I'm doing a chemsex group. It's a a format for 12-step groups and other kind of topical groups. And last night we did it again, and I had a guy from Beijing, China log on, who is a gay man who is dealing with this out of control meth addiction. And he was talking about uh, the amount of methamphetamine and chemsex in China, which kind of blew my mind. And then um, Grinder and all the apps, I mean, it's just, it's crazy to me, but, but it's a huge problem. But what we were talking about topically was obsession and his pattern, and this is such a great pattern for um, a typical pattern, I should say, is to go on a drug run or go on a sex binge, have some time, a month, two months, even three months clean, and then all of a sudden the obsession starts. And so we were talking a lot about obsession and that was kind of on my mind. I thought that would be a great topic for today's meeting. And then I happen to be reading this other cool book that I have, which happens to be authored by my colleague, Scott, right here, uh, which is a daily, a daily reader for sex and porn addiction, healing and recovery. Today's reading is Understanding the Obsession. And I just wanna read the paragraph as an introduction to what I wanna talk about because it's so right on. And remember, it deals with sex and porn addicts, but it's really universal for all addiction. As sex and porn addicts, we are preoccupied with sex to the point of obsession. If we use hookup apps, we usually have profiles of half a dozen or more, and we check them first thing in the morning. Sometimes we get up in the middle of the night to check them. And if someone has displayed interest, we'll forego a good night's sleep to drive halfway across town to act out with them. If porn is our preferred behavior, we are just as obsessive. The same is true with affairs, strip clubs, prostitutes, webcams, voyeurism, et cetera. Whatever form our active addiction takes, we can't stop thinking about it, fantasizing about it, and acting on it. And this is such a huge problem for addicts, and I think especially uh, for some of these intensity addictions that we talk about. So I just wanted to mention a few things about obsession, what kind of I find helpful. What, first of all, obsession is not unique to addiction. It's certainly a classic form of addiction, but we see that uh, obsessive kind of thinking with obsessive compulsive disorder or with other kinds of anxiety disorders. So it's something that our brains know how to do. Um, but somehow addiction really fuels it to the point where we're in that driving mode we want more. But it really hijacks. And when we're in that obsessed state, we're so kind of laser focused, we really become numb to people and events in our lives. Um, our mind just replays that same thing over and over again. And if, if the obsession is mild, we can usually work and kind of distract ourselves. A lot of people, uh, addicts I know, will be able to kind of balance somehow getting some work done or doing their lives while still being caught up in the obsession. But when it really takes hold, people are lost to it. And that's when you, uh, we'll talk about addicts on, online who will wake up, you know, or not wake up, but rather look at the clock and it's six or seven or eight hours later and they've, they've lost the whole night um, when they have to get up the next morning. So that, that it's really a problem. Our thoughts race, they run in circles. Um, we focus incessantly on worry or fantasy or that search for answers. And it really is paralyzing and ultimately leads to a compulsive behavior. You know, this is the beginning stage of, of acting out. And inevitably, the longer we're uh, soaking or steaming in obsession, we're gonna act out, it's inevitable. And there is a point of no return, I believe, where if, if as I tell my clients, if you keep kind of messing around with this, you're gonna go over the edge, and, and they do. So what to do, a um, couple tips I recommend. One, ask yourself, you know, what am I feeling? You know, what's going on here? Because as we know, addicts, addiction and addictive behaviors are not about the sex or not about the meth or not about the cocaine. They're about feelings and about controlling feelings and often numbing feelings. Sometimes they're about increasing intensity. And that's even also about numbing, I think. If we're so, um, and this is a reaction to trauma, we get so numb that we have to do something to experience a feeling. That's why people cut themselves. That's what intensity is about with addiction and acting out. It's a way to feel uh, from this kind of numb state that, that usually trauma has put us into. But most addicts don't know what they're feeling. And so I often recommend sit with it 
sit with it and, and wait for an answer and see what you get in terms of identifying an emotion. Mindfulness, uh, that's like my answer for everything. But I think mindfulness to be aware of what's going on so you can really kind of start to make the connections like, oh, when my stomach is growling or it's tense, you know, this feeling is usually coming or I have all this, you know, cramping of, in my neck, what's that about? You know, maybe I'm under stress, that kind of thing, just to kind of put the pieces together. So really having those daily habits of being mindful, um, using other senses. You know, when we get trapped in our brains, um, our brains are really strong organs uh, in our bodies. And so I find it useful to really do other things, listen to music, um, go out and, and do a mindful walk in nature, uh, move, yoga, stretch, anything kind of physical to kind of get us out of our heads and break the, the tyranny of, of that obsessive thought. Write, you know, journaling is an amazing tool. And I think sometimes, and just the way our brains are wired to create writing is different than it is for speaking. And so with speaking, our, our frontal cortex, which controls, filters what we are consciously aware of is really powerful. But when we're writing, we can, there's some workarounds around this filter in our brains. And sometimes the answers of what you write down will surprise yourself. And that's even stronger. There's an exercise sometimes therapists ask people to do with write, to write with your non-dominant hand. So I'm left-handed. I might want to write a paragraph with them as a right-hander. My left-handed writing is terrible. My right hand would be even worse. But still, it, it's a way of kind of defeating that, the filters that we have in our brain. So journaling is important. Spirituality, any kind of being in touch with your higher power, um, uh, gratitude, all that kind of stuff that kind of elevates us to kind of a higher plane. Um, connection, you know, expanding our social network. Uh, we know that people are just vital in terms of resilience and that robustness of our, our health. So anything you do to connect um, creativity, you know, hobbies, purpose, um, doing something that gives us pleasure. And oftentimes in early recovery, those are hard to find. And I know, I think a lot of us, certainly me when I was in early recovery, I'd spent so much time, addiction really was my life. And so when I stopped having addictive behaviors, I had a lot of time and I didn't really have many hobbies at that point because everything, I'd, I'd thrown everything overboard for my addiction. So uh, finding what interests you and doing things and um, doing some, especially things that with people, you know, go a team sport or a, a choir, as, as one of the people says in my uh, documentary, who's a musician in New York, um, and I won't use his language, which is quite graphic, but basically the gist of what he says is that uh, singing in harmony, singing with other people, connected and attuned, is so much better than any drug could ever be. And I think that, that connection, and there is something to that. And then finally, um, just feed your joy. You know, whatever that is. And I think, and sometimes we, we don't wanna wait for people to join us, to, but we just go ahead and do it, uh, do something and uh, get out there. So that's a lot of stuff, uh, tools for dealing with, with obsession, but I think they're all useful, but and it's such a major problem. And it just brought home to me last night, the, uh, this guy in China uh, with the same problems that we have in Florida or New York or LA, um, it, it's kind of overwhelming to me. So uh, these tools do work and they're much needed. So with that, we'll throw it open and see where we go. Scott, I, don't, I can't hear you. Before we get to questions, um, I just wanted to uh, talk a little bit about the addictive cycle, because uh, you mentioned that obsession is kind of what throws us into our addiction. And, and um, uh, the, addiction, the addictive cycle, usually we, we, have, we have a trigger of some sort, which is usually feeling. Uh, that we don't want to feel, and then we start to go into obsession, um, and and then we go around to ritualization, where you know I go online and I start looking at ads for escorts, but you know I'm not really acting out, but I'm looking at the, and then we act out, and then we feel bad about it, and then we distance, and you know, and then uh, we remember <laughs> what we were triggered by in the first place, and we get triggered again. So it's just this spin cycle. Um, and the obsession for me, <clears throat> I like to use the analogy of, you know, a big rock on top of a big hill. And obsession is where the rock is going like this. And, and once it starts to roll, it's over. Uh, you know, there's no stopping it until it gets to the bottom of the hill, you know, and crash and burns and runs over people. Um, 
So we have to, you know, it's good to recognize obsession and intervene, um, like David was talking about, uh, you know, in however you want to do it, um, but basically just get out of the obsession somehow. Um, otherwise, you're gonna you're gonna go where the obsession takes you. I mean, there's just no way. Yeah. So yeah, great topic. Um, we do have a question in already. Um, my husband has just returned from treatment. Um, can you please give me some help on how I can learn to accept his I'm sorry's? Um, in the recent months, I've shut him down, telling him I don't want to hear his apologies as I, I felt too hurt to hear them. Um, that is very common. Um, so. Yeah, it sure is. And it's a great question, too. Um, you know, when, when people return from treatment, they're really in this kind of golden spot where they feel a real shift internally, hopefully, and, and they have seen the impact they've had on other people and they're starting to get a flavor of it and the sense of it and, and uh, they're starting to have these internal shifts. Um, but they're coming home to a partner that's really been traumatized and who's had often gaslighted and lied to and um, cheated on and, and God knows what else for a long time. And sometimes it's gone on for years without that partner knowing it. So the whole, their whole world has been turned upside down. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the person coming home from treatment is in this, on this journey um, and wants to make it right. But, but um, the partner is going to take a long time to heal. And that is just something, there's a very different rhythm. Uh, the partners, um, to regain that trust, to regain some understanding, uh, takes time and support. So hopefully, first of all, I hope you both have some support in terms of a therapist, each of you having a different therapist who can provide you, because you're on kind of a separate path right now of healing. Um, now, hopefully, um, you'll, you'll come together and that healing will take place in the form of your relationship. But these I'm sorry's, um, I'm sure they're heartfelt, but I think they can be, they can sound kind of hollow if uh, this has all been pulled, you know, if this is new to you or, or these things have happened. So what we do um, structurally with the program uh, and in sex fiction in general is to really structure um, a formal disclosure where there's one event where a lot of what's happened or all of what's happened is revealed. And that happens usually not right away at all, but it happens maybe several months down the road. Um, and it's, it's something that requires a lot of preparation on both parts. And uh, you arrive at this formal disclosure with the the uh, both parties, the, the person in treatment, the partner, and their therapist. And it's all done in a very kind of formal way. The thing about disclosures is that it's really important to be, a, uh, to be thorough and, and not have what we call rolling disclosures or kind of this little bits and pieces that are kind of emerged where something will be revealed, it's a shock, the partner kind of maybe regains their balance, and then a month later something else comes out. And that's what we want to stop. And so uh, the disclosure takes a lot of preparation. And by the way, the disclosure is not about every little painful detail with that um, brutal honesty, as they say in 12-step program. It's more about categories and descriptions of behaviors, but not really trying to cause the partner any further harm, but just to really clear the air, get it all out on the table so that we can be done with that and kind of move on to the next step of healing. So, you know, I would just take your feelings. I don't think um, you have to have a response to your partner's I'm sorry. I would just focus on what you're feeling right now and talk, talk about it with your support system, whether it's your therapist or your own recovery group or your friends or your sponsor, where you can process this and just really focus on your feelings. And um, you might even ask that he not say that for a while to give you some space um, to uh, wait for the disclosure or wait till your uh, therapist can guide you in some communication exercises where you can really kind of practice this. Because I'm sure these are well meant, but sometimes they can just, after years of um, living with an active addict, they can sound kind of hollow and even painful and, and cause not only hurt, but, but anger. And so the, the, um, the result uh, can actually be the opposite of what your partner intends. So I would focus on your feelings right now, look forward to a disclosure process with your partner, with your husband, and, um, and go from there. But I would make sure you have a really robust support system for yourself right now and have all the, the uh, support that you need uh, to get you through this time. 
Yeah, um, I'm sorry, it's just not enough, usually. Um, in, in Out of the Doghouse, um, Dr. Rob writes about this, and he, you know, he's writing to the cheater or the addict. And he's saying, look, you know, I'm sorry, is it gonna cut it? Um, you have really betrayed your partner. Um, the, book, the book is written for male cheaters, uh, for, you know, for straight male cheaters, basically. So, you know, he, he writes, um, you know, she's hurting, she's, she's traumatized. And, you know, hearing that you're sorry, as David said, sounds really hollow and it actually can exacerbate the situation and make it worse. Um, and it, heaven forbid, uh, the cheater tries to throw a gift in with it, you know, like, oh, and we'll take a trip to Cancun. Here's a fur coat or what, you know, a diamond ring. It, it doesn't work. Um, what a betrayed partner needs to see is honesty, um, behavior change. And, you know, David talked about the honesty with disclosure, but it's, it's more than just disclosure. It's rigorous honesty in every aspect of life with every person in your life. Um, so the addict needs to be honest, not only with you, but with everybody. If you see the, your, your partner lying to somebody else, you're immediately going to think, oh, he's lying to me too. Um, and you can't help but think that. Um, and it, not your fault. I mean, it's, it's just a natural reaction for a human being to have. Um, so until your partner really starts to earn some trust back uh, with you by being rigorously honest, you know, telling you the truth sooner and, you know, telling you the truth and telling it sooner, uh, you're, you're probably going to not want to hear, I'm sorry. And you may want to let him know that, you know, yeah. let's work on trust and then we'll work on sorry uh, and forgiveness. Um, yeah. But, you know, you will get there. Um, if he does the work he needs to do and you're doing what you need to do and, you know, you're here, you're obviously doing some work on your, you know, to keep, to get your needs met, um, you know, there's a really good chance that you will be able to accept that apology at some point. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, ask us questions. Um, you use the Q&A feature or the chat feature. Um, we've got one here in the chat feature. I'll do this one and then the one that just showed up in the Q&A. Um, this is a related question. Um, I've been having deep anxiety about the relationship with my wife. Um, I had a two-year binge of multiple prostitutes. Um, we're three months into a separation. <laughs> um, I don't know if that's a permanent separation, a trial separation, a ther therapeutic separation. Maybe, David, you can address the differences there. Um, we had several good evenings together, although we're living separately, so this sounds like a trial or a therapeutic separation. And then she told me she needed a break. I almost had an anxiety attack. How do I manage the deep relationship anxiety that feels like it is dominating my life at the moment? How do I manage this both individually and communicating it to my partner? Great question and, and an obsession question. Right. Yeah, great question. And, and um, you know, one of the hard things about, especially the early stages of recovery, is that um, things are unfolding and we don't know the end point. We don't know the bottom line. We don't know the... The, the end of the story, uh, if it all works out and there's a happy ending or not. And I think while we're dealing with this very painful process of change and healing, it can feel, you know, glacial, geologically slow in terms of, of how it feels. So I think that's a perfect kind of place for that obsessive anxiety that you're talking about, where we want to find uh, answers and we want to have, we want to know. Uh, I used to think in my, in my addict self, uh, give me good news, give me bad news, but just don't leave me hanging somewhere, you know. Um, and, and I think living in that space, and it's a necessity right now, is really hard. And so um, that's an obsessive zone. So I'd, I'd look at some of the tools I mentioned to maybe help you deal with that um, in, in whatever way works for you. But um, this space you're in, um, you know, there's a two-year binge is a long time. And... Um, the, Scott had mentioned that some of the differences here. Uh, sometimes uh, a therapist will recommend a, a therapeutic separation where the end, the, the goal is not a permanent separation or divorce, but really to, to buy each half of the couple some time to work on their issues where they're not constantly being aggravated by each other or triggered um, or um, triggered even by well-meaning stuff like I'm sorry in the, in the previous question. So I think uh, that's a trial separation that sometimes a therapist will initiate. Other times couples initiate it themselves uh, without knowing uh, what's going to happen 
and sometimes um, they decide to, to, to separate like that. But I think the point here is that um, you're going to have to really work on your um, controlling your emotions and your feelings and this obsession, obsessive thinking, uh, using those tools, because the situation isn't going to change that dramatically that fast. Um, hopefully it will change uh, soon. But for now, um, this, is, this is where you're at. I would really recommend making sure you really talk to people about this because I think talking and sharing this is really important. Uh, and one, the, one of the worst things, for me at least, about obsessive thinking when I get caught in it is that it's, it's so painful and it's so isolating. Oftentimes my, my obsessive worries happen you know, in the middle of the night when I don't feel comfortable calling someone and you know, I, I now know enough to tell myself it, this is not going to look this way in the morning, right? It's it, it's all it was always looks a little bit different. But if you're in that obsessive thinking, it's you really have to kind of break the bubble and and, and contact people and talk about it. Uh, that's that's a great way to release some of that anxiety you're thinking about. Um, it, it might also help a little bit to understand maybe what's happening in your partner's head um, that um, that she needs a little bit of after two or three really great days together that she, she might actually, she may be feeling some anxiety. She may need to slow it down and separate a little bit because she's afraid of being re-traumatized. If I become vulnerable with you again, you can hurt me again. Um, she's probably afraid of being hurt again. Um, and that's a natural response for her and I know it's hard for you to sit through because you're going to internalize it and think it's you, not her. Um, you know, and, and for me to say it's her, I don't mean in a bad way. It's just where she is. And, um, you know, understanding that she may just need to retreat to safety once in a while. Um, it may or may not help with your anxiety. Um, you know, so... Um, let's see, uh, my spouse had a 20 plus year porn addiction and has attention seeking behavior from other women. Um, we are one and a half years from my discovery of this. I try to talk to him about his feelings and needs, uh, and he tells me he has none. Um, okay. Um, how do we move on to healing without having discussions on this? I feel like he wants to stay disconnected. Thoughts? Um. You don't say really if he's in recovery or not. I, um, I'm assuming he is, if there was discovery, that there's been some commitment on his part to change. Um, but I think one of the biggest frustrating things for someone is to be with a partner who doesn't want to talk. And I think that's kind of a classic men's, a male stereotype. But I, but I think um, communication is such an essential part of healing in this process. Um, and we talk at Seeking Integrity about um, our addiction really coming from unmet needs. And so it's, it's really critical to, uh, for every, everyone, but especially an addict, to really know what their needs are. And, and sometimes if we've grown up with dysfunctional households, we learned early on that we're not supposed to have needs and we don't have needs. And it's really hard to identify them. Sometimes uh, people really can't put their handle on it. Um, but I think that's something that's an essential skill for anyone uh, to, to manage recovery, to really get an understanding of what, what is their needs and how they can get it in a healthy way. And, and so um, this is gonna be a critical step for him uh, to be a little vulnerable. Uh, and we, you know, we also talk about sex and porn addiction as being intimacy disorders, where people really uh, stay removed and sometimes with layers of barriers between and, and silence or a lack of communication is one of those barriers. And it's a way to really not stay connected. So hopefully he is getting some sort of support. If he were my client in therapy, I'd probably look at some feelings under that and, and what fears are there. I, I really sense fear on his part. Um, and I don't know him, and that, that may be totally off base, but, but I would really work on whatever the feelings are underneath that um, so that he can really um, be more comfortable identifying and sharing those feelings. Um, I do know that sometimes couples get in this dynamic where um, one starts to pursue the feeling and, and that can shut down someone even more. So I'd, I'd also maybe just, um, whatever your style is, I would just kind of engage and not push it too much until he can get 
uh, some support for this. Uh, I found really useful uh, couples communication uh, dialogue things that they can do uh, and often they're best practiced in the therapist office, but, but really to teach people how to start to communicate and it's, it's very structured and, and helpful. So there are tools out there, but um, I'd say this certainly from your question, this is not a, a tenable place for you to be, but I think it's also not a, not a workable place from a healing perspective. So hopefully he can um, work through whatever these blocks are, uh, because that's gonna be a really important step for both of you, but especially for him. Yeah, David, let's say this question came from him um, and he's, he says, you know, Dr. Fossum, I, I, I don't know what my feelings are. I don't think I have any needs. What do you do to work with that client to help him get a handle on, yeah, he does have feelings and he does have needs and they're not getting met um, and he needs them to get met or he's going to relapse. But, you know, I mean, that's my take up. But what, what do you do to work with that person and, and help them? Um, Depending on the person, often I, I kind of almost look at um, introducing feelings almost like a foreign language, you know, the, the different feeling, what are the emotions? And, and in, in our client handbook at Seeking Integrity and in my office wall, we have those little, uh, those emojis that have different emotions, which actually are quite useful because people sometimes can't name it, but they can see it and identify it. So to really start looking at, okay, these are, these are basic human needs, these are basic feelings, how do you relate to each one and and to really go back and and oftentimes that quickly gets into some looking at their history you know what happened to that need what where did that go because children are born with needs we all have them it's normal and and they get diverted or hijacked or squelched or um somehow affected sometimes by by a dysfunctional family so uh, i'd really kind of go back and start to build from the ground up to give them an introduction to some feelings and needs and see what his patterns are. The other thing sometimes, um, it's very useful at, at Seek Integrity, it takes a while. We do a, something called a timeline where people look at, at their lives and what happened with their addictions, what happened with trauma, what happened uh, just socially in their lives, big life events. And they literally put it all on a, on a big, on pieces of paper and look at it. And it's always revealing because you can instantly see patterns that you might not have seen otherwise. Oh my God, you know, my, my porn addiction really kicked up when, when this happened or when that happened or you know, things like that. They're re are really helpful in understanding what happened to my needs because we used to have them whether we knew them or not. And so I'd, I'd really work um, at a very basic level, kind of identifying what are human needs and what are some of the emotions that we all should feel. Yeah, and you know, addicts, uh, you know, I'm an addict um, on a whole lot of levels and, and it was all about not feeling my feelings and ignoring my unmet needs. And the biggest unmet need always was a need for connection with other people. Um, you know, addiction is a lonely business and we just, we never know we're lonely until we get sober. Um, and, and, you know, he may still be, you know, avoiding those painful feelings, you know, yeah. which is fairly common. Um, this is, looks like it's a follow up to that previous question. Um, my spouse constantly tells me that he feels I'm going to cheat on him because of what he did. Um, he berates me by phone if I don't respond to him immediately. Thoughts? So, you know, there's some, some unhealthy and unhelpful uh, communication there for sure. Um, with, uh, you know, and the, the feeling that is kind of screaming in that comment is fear, right? And fear and anxiety, his fear uh, and uncertainty. So. Um, and, and when we have something like berating, which is abuse, um, and that really comes out of fear as well, usually, but it, it's hostility and anger and, and abuse, but it's coming from a place of fear on the part of the person who's doing it. So um, I think um, there's a lot of work to be done there. Um, and I think he could benefit from some time with probably a professional who could guide him through some of these basic emotions. You know, when we, uh, when we're, feeling scared or threatened or anxious, we kind of lash out sometimes like that very critically. And we project, there's a, a, a psychological defense called projection where um, I may not um, be able to identify something that I do, but I accuse you of doing it or fear you doing it. And um, so there's a lot of stuff going on here. Um, but I would really 
encourage them to get some some guidance in that and make sure you have your support too because it's not easy to sort of keep your cool when those kind of conversations are flying around you know being accused of cheating or berating and that's just not healthy um, and so um, I would recommend kind of stopping that kind of communication whatever that means and just um, taking a break from that because that's not doing anybody any good and he really needs to work on what's really going on because a lot of what I would see is projection there, just projecting onto you and probably other people, all his anxiety and uh, fears. Um, I'm gonna take, a, we've got several follow-ups here and another question, but I'm gonna take one of the follow-ups. Um, this is from uh, the individual who, they had three, a couple of nights together and then the wife needed some distance and he's feeling a lot of anxiety. Um, conversations about this, he wants to know if, um, those conversations are appropriate to happen with the partner, like I'm feeling anxiety, I wonder what you're feeling, or should it be only be done with his counselor or maybe a marriage counseling or all of the above or none of the above? How does that work? Um, you know, I think it's helpful for, for partners to talk to each other in those basic ways. Um, you know, sometimes it gets so bogged down or inevitably goes into some uh, dysfunctional kind of communication patterns like berating or something that it's not helpful. And in those cases, um, a, a professional can really provide the guidance. But, but I do think couples need to speak to each other and, and share their feelings. Um, and it can be very basic. Uh, one stem sentence I really like um, is, you know, when, when you do X, it makes me feel Y, right? And it's just, it's a statement of fact. It's like when, when you do this kind of behavior, it makes me feel sad or fearful or angry or hurt or whatever it is. And it's just, it's a kind of very basic way. Um, it's not really blaming. Um, it's not defending. It's just saying, when you do this, it's not right or wrong, but this is how I feel when you do that. And, and it's, it's that kind of clear kind of communication without, without getting into it. The other thing couples often do is, you know, um, if I'm fighting with my partner, um, if he says something, I may start my rebuttal, you know, before he even finishes his thought and I've kind of lost what he said. And so people talk past each other and, and I think it's really important to slow it down. And that, that's those exercises I was talking about really do that. They kind of structure it and slow it down to the point where I think, you know, I think healthy communication, there's a place for that everywhere. Um, but if it turns into, more accusatory or unhealthy or um, angry, then I don't think it's useful to continue that. I would cut it off. I'd walk away. I mean, I, you know, I think after, you know, when you tell me you want to take a break for a couple of days, it, you know, I feel anxiety. It's, it's okay to follow that up with, could you please tell me what you're feeling that causes you to want to take a break for a couple of days so I can understand what you're feeling? Um, is it, is it okay to say something like that, David? I would say so, yeah. Yeah, just for, th these are clarifying questions, right? To kind of understand yeah. what's going on. Yeah. Oh, and the other thing that, that's helpful, that, huh? go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, you know, we, to just bring empathy into this, which is something that um, we introduced to the, the addicts that go through our program, um, but to really include statements that convey, you know, gee, I'm sorry you feel that way, or, I can understand how you would feel that way. It just it 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 conveys um, something different from kind of the self-centered, defensive behavior of an addict. Uh, that's more like, "Gee, I'm concerned for you. I'm concerned what this is doing to you, um, and even how can I help?" You know, something like that. But but um, I think yeah, those kind of communications and showing kind of humanity and and empathy can only help. Yeah. Um, yeah, empathy is a big step in rebuilding relationships and relationship intimacy. Um, so he also adds, I feel guilty for responding to her justifiable needs in such a way by getting anxious. Um, I'm dropping a load on her when clearly this is living in my head. Any thoughts on that? Dude? Okay, well, that's, you know, that's a start because this is, you know, we, one of the things about recovery is that we have to figure out what's mine and what's yours. Yeah. And, and I think you're in this process of like discovering um, what, what belongs to you and, and that you have some control over what happens to that. And so, um, is it okay for him to, to tell her, I feel guilty for being anxious and, and kind of pushing that onto you? Um, 
or, yeah. or should he keep that to himself? You know. No, I think that's anything that can clarify the dynamics of what's going on, or or the internal process that I'm experiencing, um, without being accusatory or defensive or you know all that negative stuff. But if it's really coming, and I I really um, this is just my thing. I like to really center those conversations to really consciously connect with my heart. And, and somehow, if I'm not speaking from up here, but I'm like, and I, I really try to picture speaking through my heart as if my heart had a, a mouth, right? And, and that, it's, it somehow makes it easier for me to stay in touch with that, the human element of the communication and the kindness. You know, I think um, couples who've gone through this kind of warfare of addiction, um, everybody's traumatized, everybody's hurting, um, everybody's wounded. And I think if we can just show some basic kindness for each other in that process, it goes a long way uh, toward reestablishing a healthier way, a healthier balance in the relationship. And being vulnerable by sharing your feelings and your thoughts um, can only help to reestablish intimacy. And, and help the two of you feel closer, but it may feel weird and awkward for a while if you're right. not used to it. Um, and I think some couples where there's been an active addiction for a long time, I think, did you say 20 years, I think? Um, yeah. So there's a lot of patterns that have developed and a lot of defensiveness and shielding that's, that's taken place. And so to, even if you have a lot of motivation to connect with your partner, it's going to feel weird and it's going to feel awkward and and there's going to be some f things like guilt and and then you know I, when when we start practicing healthy communication or sharing after years of not doing it or maybe never doing it before um we don't have a good sense of it you know we can come off heavy-handed we can say too much we can say too little it's like we don't have good practice at at reading the other person and what's too much and what's not and and so I think just um, allow yourself to um, stumble a little bit, both of you, uh, but, but be gentle <laughs> with yourself, be gentle with your partner and, and, uh, and kind. I think it goes a long way. Um, okay, let's, let's hop on to another question here. Um, is obsessive thinking the same as ruminating? Yeah. I, I would say they're probably pretty interchangeable. Um, ruminating, rumination is just this, this thought spinning around in our heads that just has no escape. And, the, and I guess the classic um, mark of, of rumination is just no new information, right? I, uh, we just have the same thought in our head and we go over it and over it and when the outcome is always the same or, or worse, you know, but we don't have any kind of new information to add to it. And so that, that's a really um, it's like a shame spiral. I guess you'd call it a, a rumination spiral, but it's, it's a dead end. There's just, it doesn't go anywhere except makes us miserable. So um, yeah, rumination uh, is worry, worry without purpose really. It's just kind of that, that uh, focus on the problem. So all those skills or tools that I mentioned in the beginning of this webinar are useful for that. And I would say they're interchangeable. Um, Scott, do you have any, you're the, the word guy, any, um, no, I, th I think I think you nailed it. <laughs> so um, this this is a follow up to um, the twenty year porn addiction, um, a year and a half after discovery, um, and the guy's sort of saying he doesn't have any feelings or needs. Um, so we had kind of said we don't know if he's in recovery or not. Um, the comment here is he went to two therapy sessions and a few drop in groups. Um, he says he has no dysfunctional family. Um, he said he only did the porn for pleasure. Thoughts. Okay, well, first of all, we know that sex addiction and porn addiction are not about the sex, and they're often not about the pleasure. It's always about uh, numbing, escaping, f fleeing, checking out. It, it's not sexual, and I think that's one big mistake that, that people often, often make, uh, to talk about it in those terms. Yeah, I mean, um, I'll, I'll use me as an example. When I got into recovery. I mean, I got into recovery because my world blew up. I mean, it blew up. Um, everything was <clears throat> uh, personal, professional, private, gone. Um, so I went to therapy and um, 
you know, I didn't think I had any childhood trauma. And, you know, I needed that, that chart that David mentioned earlier with the emojis. My therapist gave me one because <laughs> he'd say, what are you feeling? I'm like, um, I don't know. Uh, you know, I had two feelings, you know, horny and angry. Um, and those are not primary feelings. They are manifestations of primary feelings. And, I, you know, I just, I could not identify and, you know, I would literally like look at the little emojis and go, this one, this one, this one. And then I'd see what the word was below it. Oh, frustrated. Um, you know, and, and needs. Uh, you know, I was, I learned early on not to trust anybody else to meet my needs. And so I must be needless. Well, I wasn't needless. Um, and that's the pain of not getting my needs met. Um, was was the driver for my addiction but i had been doing it for so long that i had lost touch with the reality of my feelings and the reality of my needs and i think that's really common for addicts is we just lose contact with it because we never trusted it um and we just ran away from it and 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 shut it down and to open that box up is really scary and it's difficult um, and you know i think in a way, um, I kind of believe what he believes because I've seen so many clients who talk about no issues in their childhood, you know, and oftentimes there's no memories of childhood, you know, before six or eight or 10. Um, and, but when we start pulling threads, uh, it turns out there's a whole lot of stuff going on. But I've always, I'm always surprised at, at how people don't really recognize it at first, uh, where they really believe everything was fine. Um, well, maybe it wasn't so fine. You know, I think uh, there's, there's a lot of stuff that has gone on sometimes. And I think sometimes if, if you've been acting out, it can seem like, because with sex and porn addiction, the, the drive is so intense. Uh, it feels like that's the primary focus. But what we know is that that drive just didn't, land there it, it developed out of a need to um not a conscious need but a, a a process whereby those um feelings are kind of displaced and and numbed and certain things are are dealt with through this exciting intensity of of an addiction so it's you know it's a very common misunderstanding that sex addiction is all about sex you know um it's not uh not any anywhere near it and so i think to really Hopefully he can get some help and go, go do some examination because I've had many clients who came in saying everything was just hunky dory in their, in their life. And when we start looking at some of the discrepancies and that's what a good therapist would do here is look at some of the discrepancies. You know, well you say, uh, gee, you had a fabulous experience in eighth grade, but what about, you know, X, Y, Z happening at that same time or, or whatever, where things just don't add up. And very quickly, uh, people can start to get a, a clearer view of, of what's been going on. So I do hope he gets yeah, it. I mean, I, I, I had to have a therapist somewhere in the first year or so of therapy say, you know, you were really badly abused as a child. And I was like, no, I wasn't, you know, because nobody hit me and nobody actually touched my penis. Um, I thought I wasn't abused. And he's like, everything you've been telling me for the last six months is child abuse. <laughs> you know, and, and I had to do some reading and I really had to spend a lot of time wrapping my head around the fact that this idealized childhood <laughs> was pretty awful. Um, right. and, and it did a number on me. So yeah, I mean, but I believed that I hadn't had any family dysfunction. Um, I truly believed it. And, and yeah, so and, and he, he needs to go to some therapy. Yeah, <laughs> to totally. <laughs> And I, my experience was maybe similar because I wasn't, I was emotionally abused, but not some of those, you know, physical sexual abuse. But what I experienced was neglect. And I think right now, therapists, last five or 10 years, have gotten a renewed appreciation of the profound traumatic effects of neglect. You know, just kind of not, not your needs don't matter as a child in that, in that home. You're kind of nobody, you're just, nobody's interested for whatever reason. And uh, that's really a painful place to, to be. And so that's also traumatic. So uh, 
there's all kinds of avenues and sometimes it doesn't look like the image of what we think um, can lead to some of this, but um, yeah. There, I did a talk, Scott was at this past week, I've done a lot of work with, with adverse childhood experiences and, and we know that those can be all the abuse things, emotional, physical, sexual, but it can also be um, a neglect, it can be having a, a sibling who is disabled, it can be any, anything, a parent who's out of work, a parent who dies, a parent who's an addicted person, anything that kind of makes that life unusual. And the, the unbelievable impact of those, uh, people that have four of those, for example, are 11 times more likely to be injection drug users, uh, all kinds of mental illness, depression, anxiety, even a shorter lifespan. So, so these things have a profound impact on us unless we are lucky enough to kind of find some guides as adults and work it through um, because those things just set a course in our lives that, that is really destructive. So um, hopefully uh, he can get some help and get some clarity because um, I think there's just a lot, a lot more to that than what he's giving. Um, I want to read the follow-up comment from this and then there's another question. So I, I just kind of want to read this if you want to say something, you know, say so David, but otherwise we'll skip straight to the next question. Um, this is about the individual we're discussing. He was watching foreign, foreign with cousins at 14. There's one. His mom died when he was 16. There's two. His brother-in-law took him to strip clubs after that. There's three. Uh, he was made fun of and called geek. There's four. Girls were not interested. There's five. I mean, that's five traumas. Um, you know, yeah. So is it any wonder he's, you know, got addicted to something, and particularly something right. sexual like porn? And, and a lot of those are, are sexual contexts, right? Being sexualized for, you know, connection, companionship, friends, yeah. brotherhood, whatever. I mean, it's all in a sexual context. So there's a yeah. lot there. There's a whole lot there. Yeah. Um, um, okay, I want to hop onto this question. Um, I'm a betrayed spouse who is struggling. Um, D-Day was three and a half years ago with his sex and porn addiction and other terrible behaviors. Um, my husband of 40 years, now says that he is bisexual slash gay, his words. Um, he goes to Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous one time a week. Uh, he has a sponsor. Um, he has a Christian sex addiction therapist one time a week. He goes to church, et cetera. With that said, um, I discovered on his TV that he's been watching gay movies on Amazon. These are not porn movies, it's just gay movies. <coughs> um, the movie covers are suggestive, um, look like sexual content. <coughs> Um, I said he shouldn't be watching them and asked that he not watch them anymore. He said it isn't porn, this is who he is, that I'm asking him to go back in the closet. Um, he will not stop watching them and he will not be monitored. Um, he's supposedly seven months in recovery. Is it okay for him to watch these movies because he needs to connect, because he needs to connect with his newfound open identity, even um, if they have a level of sex sexual content? And then she had, I am deeply hurt. What do I do if he refuses to respect how I feel about this? Um, and then what is your opinion of mixed orientation marriages? I'm so confused. Wow. There's a lot there. I'm just trying mm -hmm. to review yeah. this real quick. Um, so first of all, on the, on the material that he's watching, um, things don't have to be explicitly porn, pornographic to be arousing, to have someone in their addictive space, headspace. You know, so a lot of times- Emotionally and romantically arousing too, you know, um, sometimes I call it not porn, but it's still porn. Right, it's still getting those same neurotransmitters firing. Um, and you know, even uh, we'd have clients talk about um, Facebook and Instagram and all the suggestive photographs, that there's a lot of kind of pornographic, softcore porn on, on Facebook and Instagram. So. So those things are out there. So I think, um, you know, this is a complicated question because orientation, and this is a, a also not an uncommon thing where people get married um, and there may be a, a broader sexual orientation than just heterosexual. And, and that's something that we distinguish from addiction, right? A, an orientation is something that uh, is not an addiction. Uh, it's not an addictive behavior. It's, it's a, it's something that's, that's much more internal and hardwired. And it's something that um, is very painful for, for couples to work through. Uh, each couple has to kind of work it through. In my experience, to be frank with you, is that 
um, that kind of attraction probably isn't going to go away. Um, and so, uh, and it oftentimes with, uh, if there's a, a strong Christian presence or faith-based presence, or uh, there's a lot of shame and guilt about these feelings and, and uh, people really struggle with it a lot. Um, the, I think the important dynamic here, two, because there's several. One is that I don't think that's a good thing for him to be doing in recovery. Um, and I think he'd need to talk to his sponsor, maybe therapist about that behavior and where that should go in his recovery plan. Uh, it sounds, um, well, I won't say any more, but he needs to really think about that consciously. But the second thing is that you've made a request on what to do. And um, of course, there's gonna be a lot of feelings if he won't comply or fails to comply. And, and I, I think bottom line is that um, he needs to think how, if he has these attractions, same sex attractions, how those are gonna manifest, what they're gonna be, and it really needs to be a mutual thing in the marriage. Um, for him to be doing this really kind of semi-addictive or really frankly addictive behavior still in this kind of soft core headspace, I think is very troublesome. Uh, so that that's one problem. And then the communication piece and what to do with your marriage is a bigger problem. Um, I've had couples who could work this out in many different ways. Uh, some could not. So I think it's something, it's a real, um, a real serious struggle for both of you. But I would, uh, the, I think the first thing is to have him look at this behavior and really evaluate the addictive potential of what those soft core uh, movies are. Um, what they're doing in his headspace, as Scott mentioned, emotionally, not just physically or sexually, but kind of in that addictive headspace. And then secondly, how are we gonna work through this expression of that same sex attraction or not uh, in a way that works for both of you? And that's a long-term, more couples issue. But I think none of that can happen until he gets clear on his addictive behavior and what's, what's, what is and what's not that addictive behavior. Um, yeah, Scott? You know, from, from a relationship standpoint, uh, you've been married uh, 40 years and three and a half years ago, he finally decided to tell you he has an attraction to men. Um, I suspect if he wasn't acting on it in any way, it probably wouldn't bother you very much. Um, it doesn't sound like the attraction to men is the problem. It's that he's acting on it. Um, and, you know, and if he was attracted to other women and acting on it, you'd, <laughs> you'd still be struggling with that. Um, you know, he doesn't uni unilaterally get to change your relationship boundaries um, just because he, he finally got up the nerve to tell you that he's bi or gay. Um, you know, when... That's that it wasn't part of your marriage vows in sickness and in health, you know, except for this, you know, that except for this probably wasn't in your marriage vows. Um, so I think you have every right to feel uh, hurt and betrayed um, by, by his behavior. So please don't beat yourself up about it. Um, that's my point there. Um, you know, I'm like David, mixed, marriage, mixed orientation marriages can work. I've seen them work but both partners have to mutually reach an agreement on relationship boundaries. You know, this is how we're gonna make this work. Um, and it sounds like he's, he's not too keen on that. He just wants to do what he wants to do right now, um, which is sad. Um, and, and she adds here, um, he says, I will not be involved with his recovery. David, how do you feel about that last statement? Uh... I'm sorry, Scott, I'm not sure which this one. Is the, this is the, it shows up as the next question. He says, I will not oh. be involved with his recovery. He doesn't want her involved in his recovery. Oh, well, guess what? You are involved in his recovery. You were involved by his addiction, and by default, you're involved in the recovery. Um, and so, yeah, as Scott said, he, it's, he doesn't have the right to, to make these choices on your behalf. Uh, and this affects you as well. And so... Um, yeah, I think uh, whether he likes it or knows it or not, you you are involved because it's your marriage as well. And so um, you have every right to be, to have an interest in this um, and to have feelings about it. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Yeah, you have a 40 year vested interest in this one. <laughs> um, 
I want to skip back up here. This is more of a comment about we've got just enough time to read it and maybe David can comment on it a little bit. Um, speaking of needs, I've actually Googled basic human needs because I couldn't identify what I needed from other people. Uh, thank you for confirming that. That's my world too. Um, the comforting thing about that reading was that I learned it was normal for wanting my partner to meet my needs. David? What a concept. Uh, yeah, it, it is. You know, we need other people. We, need, we, have for, we have physical needs, we have emotional needs, we have sexual needs, and, and those are served with other people. And so um, that's the, the need you identified there is the sort of core basic one that we, we thrive when we're connected. You know, we die when we're not. And, and I think it's really important to, to recognize that and find healthy ways to get that. You know, um, I, I got so many clients come to mind over a, a chemsex guy who came to, to treatment and his, his uh, when we have an emergency contact was some guy with the first name from Grinder. I mean, that, that was the point of his, his human need was being met by, by somebody like that. And so it just, you know, we, we need healthy human needs, but that, that is the core right there. Absolutely. Yeah, um, we've got one little last question come in. So let's go ahead and take it. We've got a minute left here. Uh, my spouse feels he doesn't need therapy because his acting out will never happen again. Your thoughts? <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I think uh, as an addict, I can't tell you how many thousands of times I said that this will never happen again. Uh, I'll never do that again. Um, you know, boy, that's the last time. And I mean, that's just an addict talking. Uh, it just, that, that doesn't, that, that's really empty calories in terms of a statement. Could, couldn't agree more. <laughs> okay, everybody, we are out of time. Um, great session today, great topic on obsession, led to a great discussion. Thank you everyone for your questions. Uh, David will be back next Wednesday. Sure will. And we hope to see you then. Thanks everyone. Have a good evening. Bye, Scott. Bye.